So there's so much I could say about Dr. Zogby because his uh, biography is quite long. But I will say there are, are few people who know as well about working across religion, race, culture, and how our struggles for liberation for our individual communities are connected. Dr. Zogby himself, a Arab American, uh, Lebanese American Catholic, uh, studied under uh, Ishmael al Farouk and obtained his PhD in Islamic studies from Temple University. And while working to uplift the Arab American community here, uh, he became the deputy campaign director, or the campaign director, campaign, campaign manager, manager <laughs> for Reverend Jesse Jackson when Reverend Jackson ran for president. And, and as he says often, when he introduced him in his run, he said, you know, I'm the, the son of an illegal immigrant introducing the grandson of a slave, and that is the promise of America, and that is where our hope lies, and I think we very much need that hope. So Dr. Zogby, as you'll hear, has, has known Representative Jonathan Jackson for a, a long time, and Representative Jackson long worked on gun violence before coming to Congress, and since coming to Congress, uh, helped lead a community roundtable on gun violence, and then shortly after, we at Fellowship of Reconciliation had the great privilege of having Representative Jackson introduce our um, faith leader's letter calling for Mother's Day to be declared a day of repentance and action on gun violence. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to these two great men. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. And thank you to the FOR for, uh, for hosting this conversation. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Congressman. I, when, when I'm about to say Jackson, first word always comes out Reverend, but <laughs> Congressman Jackson. Um, the, the last panel was extraordinary, and I really appreciated both your questions, but also the, the panelists and their focus on the degree to which conditions create this unsettled environment in which violence becomes a, a path forward for, for many. It's, uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to deal with a couple of other concerns and, and speak to the congressman about them. One, obviously, is the role that, that Congress can play, the role that legislation can play. Um, can it play a role? And if, if it can, why isn't there <laughs> more uh, action to deal with with this, the other one is is uh, the, the issue of um, the the gun companies and the role that they play. I mean, we we, we, we go after pharmaceutical companies uh, when they do. We go after car manufacturer. Ralph Nader was a friend of mine and is a friend of mine, I should say. And you know, the the degree to which we've tackled car safety and and pollution and and water clean water, all has to do with companies creating a problem or helping to feed a problem, but gun companies get off the hook. Um, and the final issue that I wanted to raise is the, is the culture question. Um, and it's not the way it was talked about in the, in the last panel, but it's the, I wrote a piece in the FOR magazine on, on, uh, on, on gun culture in America. There was a film back in the 50s called Gun Crazy. Uh, it's about a young boy staring at a, a, a gun in a, in a window in a shop and breaks the window to get the gun and the judge asks him, why'd you do it? And he said, I, I don't know. He said, there's something about when I hold a gun, I feel like a real person. Um, and if you, that has been so much a part of, from the time we're kids playing cowboys and Indians, which now is embarrassing to me that we even did that, or, or, or cops and robbers or whatever we did, you know, the first instinct, the little kids go like this with each other um, and it's play, but it's not play. I mean, there's a gun crazy culture. And I look at the pictures of these guys at the, the gun shows and they're holding these weapons in their hand. They got this glazed look in their eye, like, you know, like I feel like somebody just like the, the kid in the movie. Um, can we start there if, if you don't mind Congressman and talk about the, the crazy gun culture in America that like 
we have, I mean, since this day started, you know, the, the numbers are one homicide every 11 minutes. It's crazy. Two mass shootings every single day. More guns than we have people. There's one point, one and a quarter gun for every guns for every person in America. Um, what do we do to unwind that? Can can we even begin to tackle that? And who would be the person? Who would be the group to tackle it? Well, first of all, let me say thank you to everyone that's come out and given of your time and energy and your talent on this Saturday. You're here because you care about this very important topic. And thank you, um, Dr. Zogby. I can't pretend like I don't know him. He's Uncle Jim. Um, we've got a long, we've got a long history, and I appreciate the work that you've done. And uh, to digress one moment, when uh, Uncle Jim Zogby started working with my father some 40 years ago now, um, don't forget that it wasn't until the 2000 census that even the ethnicity of Arab American was even recognized. So there were no recorded Arabs in America until the 2000 census. And so what Dr. Zogby has been doing for all these many years is truly remarkable. Can you give him a round of applause for me? Well, I would tell you, Uncle Jim, that the fish starts stinking at the head, and it's alive and well. If you look at uh, the vice president, J.D. Vance, only a heartbeat away, uh, potentially from being the president of the United States, a smoother, slicker, talking person that can obfuscate words and turn meanings around, and people can be confused. Uh, and his hillbilly elegy, uh, he starts talking about his nana, grandma, something, and she has 19 guns in the house. And at their convention, it was met with laughter as if it was funny. I mean, this is at the highest level of government. Um, I'm a member of Congress, and we go through orientation for our first session in the two weeks a little boot camp on what does a congressman do? And you get to ask questions all about the building and why do you get around? And one person in the hall raises his hand and says, can we carry our guns up here? And the sergeant of arms answered, well, we have Capitol Police. It's a policing body that's specifically assigned to work with members of Congress. It's very safe up here. But to answer your question specifically, yes, you can. Members of Congress can carry guns on the Hill. And the room, a certain group of people in the room, broke out into applause. So uh, when the Democrats took over, they put up the screening because of January 6th. When the Republicans came, they took the screening down. And so there are members of the Congress walking on Capitol Hill with a gun right now. So it's a sick culture. And I can't help but reflect upon, when you talk about the culture and the context, 70 years ago, uh, everyone had to go through a uh, nuclear drill at the school where you had to go underneath the desk. I don't know what going underneath the desk will do in a nuclear bomb attack, but that's what they told you to do. And then 40, 50 years ago, we all had to do a fire drill and now children today are doing gun drills in school. Uh, a friend of mine's child was said he was misbehaving and wasn't being compliant, wasn't following instructions. And so the son, the father got the son on their phone and said, well, what happened? And they said, well, they were doing a gun drill. And uh, they told us in the case of the gun drill, we have to jump off the second story of the building. And I was afraid. So I didn't follow through on the instructions. So it's so deeply seated. And when we talk about our Second Amendment, this is so highly orchestrated on the right to bear arms. We're not talking about the Second Commandment, you know, I'm not, not having anybody else but God to be your God. Like, it's the Second Amendment. It's something that we cherish. And I've tried to look at this through a historical and an anthropological point of view. And that's why it's very important that you understand when people say our nation is a land of immigrants, you really have to back up to put it in context. We are a land where genocide was performed. That's where the original gun violence began. Mm -hmm. If someone invites you into their house at Thanksgiving time, you can't find food, and they share with you a turkey. They give you some other food, and then all of a sudden you realize, mm -hmm. hey, I like it in your house. I don't want to go outside. And then you take out your gun, and you're in their vestibule. Then you're in their lobby. Then you're in their bedroom, and you kick them out of their house. 
then all of a sudden you have to build a fence. You have to build a wall. You have to say, I need to carry a gun at all times because that's how the land was taken. There were 20 plus million people here that had already settled. Christopher Columbus did not found this land where people had already been a civilization. So there's the history of those that have been genocide. There's a history of those that have been kidnapped. And then there's the immigrants that have come over here. I have to put that in the context of how deep the gun culture is, but that's how the land was settled. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the only way I can make any sort of sense of it. And now everything else is amongst fear of divisiveness, you versus him. They're going to come and take yours, and then the story goes on. Yeah, I see your, your, your colleagues, um, a couple of them sent out Christmas cards a few years ago with the congressperson, their spouse, and their kids carrying assault weapons in front of a Christmas tree. And I said, I don't, I don't get this. <laughs> this is not Jesus. This is not Christmas. This is sick. But this. And there was a member this at the start of this Congress passing out lapel pins yeah. of AK 47s. Yeah. And there's a. Um, so it's deeply ingrained into the culture. And, and let, me, let me just go to the law. Let me shift from that because you mentioned the Second Amendment. I read the Second Amendment, right to bear arms. I'm a Catholic, so I can make a joke. I said, you know, we solved that a long time ago. Women have the right to wear sleeveless dresses to church, which they didn't back when I was growing up. So we have the right to bear arms in the Catholic Church. That's, 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 that's sorry, silly, <laughs> silly, <laughs> silly, silly. But, 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 but it's the right to bear. Okay, it's the right to bear arms as part of a well-organized militia, well-regulated militia. The, the, the stretch of the right to bear arms to you can in Virginia buy a weapon every month and there was an effort to, to regulate that to one a month rather and they voted it down they wouldn't vote it I mean the right to bear arms as part of a militia as opposed to you can have 19 guns in your home um, I, I, how do you get to unwind that Second Amendment, or can you even do it? Well, we are the lawmakers. It can happen within 24 hours. If everyone in that rotunda gets together in the Congress, 435 people, that's one of the magical mm -hmm. moments of entering that building, is that in this rotunda on planet Earth right now, this body of people can create a trillion dollars. This body of people can uh, send food. This body of people can build roads. This body of people can fill, fix the water systems around the world. So the power is in Capitol Hill. So that is a fact. Is the will there? No. no. And that goes into the, each one of these communities. There is an enormous amount of swatting that's going on currently with some of these members. Uh, Mr. Trump has unleashed this level of fear across the society. And the swatting, for those that aren't familiar with it, is someone calls in to the police department, uh, Uncle Jim is up here right now, you've got to come over to the church. Uh, there's somebody that's holding him hostage, and he's a black guy that's holding a mic that has on a suit. I mean, and before you know it, the police are coming in with guns drawn, and they don't know. It's, uh, they're simply trying to rescue a man that you said was held hostage, and that was somebody else that had been assaulted. And they come in there. So they've done that to many members of the Congress. The press isn't trying to pick up on that, on how many members of their Congress have and the, how many Republicans have resigned because of fear. There was one of the congressmen in Ohio. He said, this isn't worth it, what they're doing to my family. And so Mr. Trump has that in the air. The, uh, the press has not covered it adequately. So there's a level of fear. What happened on January 6th when President Trump says, um, these are prisoners of war. And as soon as I get in there, they will all be set free. Uh, if you listen to some of the testimonies of the people that are getting convictions now, there is no apology. There is no remorse. I did it. we we'll do it again. I was supposed to be there. When you saw President Joe Biden said he was going to enter the race, and he was in Charlottesville, and we should do a better job on highlighting our heroes like Heather Heyer that was killed in Charlottesville that was at the right place at the right time and standing up. I'm not the biggest person on taking down all the statues. They never should have been up there. We should put the right moniker underneath them, and we should build the other side of the story and erect our statue. I don't want to see history erased. I just want to see it made whole and we tell the truth. But we should know the name of Officer Sicknick, Donald Trump, Vance. They won't say that. An officer started off his day like everyone else, wanted to do his right by his country, 
And then this mob that was incited by the president mm -hmm. comes up there and kills an officer. And there is no mention of his name. Well, I've got something in the works to mention his name and to honor him. And I'll share that with you in the future. But let the good people mm -hmm. stand up. It's the bad people that get too much of the attention, Uncle Jim. So we're not, we're not going to get rid of the Second Amendment or even have a, I guess you can use the word, common sense interpretation of the Second Amendment. But there have been legislative efforts to do some things that ought to be done that might make the situation a little bit better. The, let me, let even me they answer have that specifically. Yeah. I'm very hopeful because you've got a young member like Maxwell Frost uh, who comes in here and champions on gun violence. You have uh, Moskowitz who comes in. So there's a generation now that has been profoundly affected by gun violence, mm -hmm. unlike any of our other generations. So they are now beginning to sprout, emerge, if you will, to come to the Congress. And that is a growing body of belief. There are some people that are from an old school that think that's the only way that you're safe. And they think 440 million guns on the street makes us safe. But there's another, there's something hopeful. Uh, the press conferences, uh, those of us that have signed on to the legislation, so it's moving in the right direction. Talk about what those reforms are that m that are in consideration uh, that, and the impact that they might have. Um, reforms that could be, that are under consideration now is on having to, uh, the uh, 30 days of clearance that you simply have to uh, have a holding period. You just cannot go through a, a gun shop and buy a gun on the shop, on the streets, number one. Another part of consideration is in there is the ban on the clips for the assault weapons. The Supreme Court just let that law sunset, so that went backwards in time. George Bush had implemented it, and then they let the, the courts have been overly uh, generous in their interpretation. The other part is to be able to trace guns, that you can go to a gun shop. Um, you can, you, it's crazy. You can go to Texas and vote with your gun license, but you can't vote with your student ID. I mean, this thing is all across the board. Another part would be on uh, tracing the guns. If you have to sell a car, you've got to get the VIN number registration. Why don't you have that same sort of uh, laws in effect on tracing the sale of a gun? So we can privately sell guns without it being traced. And Uncle Jim, you've heard about a drug bust, but why haven't we heard about a gun bust? Okay, and this is the only product where the manufacturer is not held liable. Uh, I was talking with the ambassador to Mexico. They have uh, one gun shop in Mexico, 120 plus million people. And that one gun shop is owned by the government for the military. There are 3,500 gun shops on the Mexican US border and they sell guns into Mexico. There's, there's not, I come from Chicago, we have a high level of guns. Um, and the plague that affects it, there's not one gun shop in the city of Chicago. There's not one gun range in the city of Chicago. There's not one African-American gun or arms dealer in the United States. And no African-American or African manufactures bullets that I could find. And yet the south side and the west side of Chicago is flooded with guns. These guns, we know where they're coming from. There's a place on the south end of the city and the suburbs um, and it's called uh, Chuck's Gun Shop. The police can trace back 70 to 80% of the gun violence to that gun shop and those guns that are reported. We also had an issue where they do the gun buyback, and there was a judge whose father died. He turned his father's gun in. He got paid $50. That gun ended up being reported in a, in a violent crime. Somebody used that gun that was sold to the police station in a gun buyback program. So it is so porous, it's so filthy. Um, these are specific laws that we, that we can change. And one of the comedians says, why don't you put a serial number on the bullets so that way you can find out who shot it. I mean, there are common sense things that we can do that other countries have already done. Just uh, thinking as you're talking about uh, guns on the border coming in, there, uh, I watch a lot of BBC uh, uh, mysteries and there's one that uh, it takes place in Australia. It's a mini series in Australia, and it's about a, 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 a somebody in the prosecutor's office who gets assigned a special case that they want to get to the bottom of because uh, seven guns were smuggled into the country uh, illegally, and they want to know where those seven guns are. And I said, "Wait, Australians worrying about seven guns?" And it's like. <laughs> 
you know, uh, there, and they find them. They find the person doing it. But 440 million guns in America, seven guns in Australia becomes a crisis. 440 million. It's like, eh. so let me put that into what, uh, and this is the reason that J.D. Vance is so dangerous. When they asked him the question about school safety, he basically said, but he said it so eloquently that it went past me. You had to wait to catch up with What did he just say? I felt like I was talking to P.T. Barnum in a circus act. Uh, he ended up saying, you need more police at the school. And some schools want to see children with guns. Now, one of the more horrifying things I've ever experienced, um, and I come from a neighborhood that has a lot of guns, that I was in uh, Tel Aviv many years ago, and I'm in the mall, and I see children minding their business on a regular day after school with book bags, and then I can notice on their hips they have a gun, a handgun, and it's an open carry. And I started looking around. I got uncomfortable. I left the mall. I'm like, these children have guns. And they're like, yeah, because it could be a terrorist threat. It could be a bomb, this and that. I'm like, this is awful. Like, who wants to see children weaponized? And now the children are carrying bigger guns. So the fear begins to breed and feed upon itself. Mm -hmm. And now they will never be secure. Yeah. And what I see what's happening now is the gun laws get slags and there's more open carry and concealed carry. Uh, you can see when somebody's walking a little tougher and uh, standing up a little faster. Uh, there are more guns on people's hips or in their purse or in their pocket. And that's what's leading to a, an increase in the gun violence. It doesn't make people safe when more people have guns. And that's where we are, Uncle Jim. I remember th there was a shooting, in a ma one of those mass shootings in Louisiana in a theater. And they had a thing on CNN that night, and they had a, a guy on saying that the solution is if more people had guns in the theater, that wouldn't have happened. And I said, I'll never go to a movie again. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine in the dark and through, somebody shoots and everybody pulls out their guns and starts shooting, and you'd end up with n a massacre in that place in the name of safety. It's like there, there's, no, there's no cultural restraint on the use of it. It's like it's... Uh, and if you look at the caliber of the gun, yeah, yeah. Uh, these guns that have the bump stock, that have the automatic, um, they say, well, it's for hunting. You could not shoot a deer with this automatic weapon. It would be too much lead in the deer for you to eat. I mean, it makes no sense. And to think that uh, civilians, and I know several civilians, that have more weapons than the police. I mean, you can go straight off of, uh, I think the shop is Eagle, off of 159th Street, and the size of guns that are in there, that average citizen. So these are the good people. Many people here, I don't think, go to a gun shop. But please go to a gun shop and see. You would think that this was a restricted area that you would need special clearance to get to, and the sweetest, gentle lady in here can walk out with a gun as big as yourself that uh, people are buying. And if you ever go to a gun range, which I've been to several, uh, several times, this thing heats up. I mean, and you'd be astonished to see the level of weaponry. And then, of course, you know, this thing spiked under the Obama's years. It's fear. You're going to take our guns away. This is my right. But it all comes out of fear. Well, what do you do about gun companies? Should there be liability? And are there, are there restraints on that in, in Congress? There are no restraints on it. And that's where this would have to go, is to the manufacturer. The manufacturers know who they've sold to. And there are laws right now that are preventing uh, police departments from going to the gun manufacturers to saying, where do you ship, who do you ship to? Here's where we could collaborate and do something with the police department. And the police department has been far too silent. Uh, this is in the police department's best interest. Why would they want to show up on a scene of something violent to see, not know who has weapons more, uh, more dangerous than themselves? And that's going on all the time. But the police department says nothing. And I, don't, I can't understand that. If I were in the job that had to show up and people potentially could have this level of armament, I would be standing with the advocate of the citizens. I would trust the police to guard us all and not have the citizens to have this level of weaponization. Thank you. Um, do we have time for questions? Okay, we have time for questions, but I have just one last one I want to ask you before we get any, any folks who want to come up to the mic over here. Um, you see people's head turning left to the food a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last, last, last question from me. 
um, what can people do as part of an electorate, an informed electorate, uh, to to deal with with this issue? How can how can they play a role? Number one, I thank you for coming out today. So important. Number two, let's bring our children to these events. Um, our children are actually ahead of us on this. Let's take the same form and get the clergy involved. And I was particularly honored to be a part of this. And thank you, <coughs> Uncle Jim, for inviting me out. I'm a part of the prayer breakfast on Thursday mornings on Capitol Hill. And I am convinced if we're going to meaningfully change something on Capitol Hill, it starts through the religious community. I 100% believe that from the time that's been. It's not just through the legislation. It's through the people and the bodies of faith that are moving it. Who is the Speaker of the House? And Mr. Johnson, if you go by his office, you'll see a Christian national flag outside of his office. Okay? Uh, when they asked Donald, Donald, Donald Trump, uh, he basically had to genuflect before the Southern Baptists and tell them uh, that he was going to overturn Roe, Roe versus Wade. And he went before the other commissions and said, these are the judicial nominees that I'm going to appoint. This thing comes back to the faith community. We have to get our faith community. They've done a lot. They have to continue to do more to push this envelope. And some of the most uh, violent people that are up there, Mr. Huggins, Higgins out of, South, out of uh, Louisiana, that said the Haitians ought to leave the country and other things. He's from Louisiana, and he walks around with his Bible on the, uh, on the floor of, of the Congress. And I'm like, are you serious? So it starts in the faith community. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it for myself. The Speaker of the House, Mr. Johnson, calls himself a Christian national. And you know when they asked President Donald Trump what's his favorite book, he says, uh, The Art of the Deal. They said, well, a book that you didn't write, you know, something else that you're not selling. He said, The Bible. They said, well, what's your favorite book in the Bible? He says, The Whole Bible. <laughs> then they asked him to, to, to quote a scripture, and he says he likes two Corinthians and a Galatian. I mean, the man doesn't know anything about it, but he is 100% appealing to the faith community, although misguided. He's talking about us, folks. When he says we need to organize the faith community and do this work, he's talking about us. So we have, we're going to make sure to let the representative get out of here in nine minutes. Can I say one other oh, thing? Sure. January 20th is Inauguration Day. Let's plant the seed now on how we're going to honor Reverend Martin Luther King, and let's start looking forward to building out everybody in this community and have a show out and a show up for people in the faith community and come forward with our agenda. We at FOR will be talking to your family about that. So uh, we're going to have time for just a sip of questions. So I'm totally, what you just said is the thing. I'm a former Christian nationalist, born and raised Baptist, went to war, put down my weapon because the good Lord told me to love my enemies, not kill my enemies. But the religious people are the most violent and committed among us. So how do we, how do we get the religious folks to stop being so committed to violence? Uncle Jim? <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I did in the study of religion is the way religion is used. It's a, uh, one of the anthropologists said it's a system of symbols used to emphasize certain things. And so there is a, I, I wrote a piece one time called the use and abuse of religion. Um, all over the world, religions are abused to sort of put a punctuation mark on what you want. So you're right. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible that says you should kill your enemy. There's nothing in the Bible that says you know, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, strike them back on the cheek. I guess Jesus did say, he who lives by the sword, but he didn't say anything about guns, so maybe it's okay. There may be, you know, I mean, that's the point, is that there's this stretching of the faith that doesn't mean, it has nothing to do with the faith. It has to do with, I want this, and I'm going to say Jesus said it was okay to do it, or I'm going to say that that the Old Testament prophets said it's okay to do it, or I'm going to say that Muhammad said it was... I mean, people use religion to emphasize or to put a punctuation point on an existing political 
feeling or belief or whatever. And, um, um, and so it is a convening of religious leaders of a different mind. The panel I heard this morning and some of the pastors who are here can play the lead role. And it's not so much you and I can go to Mike Johnson, but other religious leaders can go to Mike Johnson and say, this has got nothing to do with Jesus. Or can go to Muslims and say, it's got nothing to do with what the prophet was all about. It's got, stop using it to serve your purpose instead of using it to serve the purpose that God actually spoke through his prophets saying. I mean, that's... that's I, I 100% agree. And unfortunately, even in the school curriculum, I think it's a bad idea when you don't teach religion. You should teach all religions and people should find uh, a level of faith. And so now there's, ah, you can't teach religion. Well, religion is at the base of law, which is at the basis of the structure of society. So uh, this is a conversation we've closed our mind to. And unfortunately, fewer people are going to church, and they're kind of involuntarily moving and not knowing while they're part of uh, an ethos, a system that's already in motion. I think that you've described it well, and I'd love to know more about your personal story and testimony. Um, I've known some people that have converted um, that are like the Tim McVeighs, and let's not downplay the Tim McVeighs, that there's a growing people. What you saw on January 6th to me was like a, that was a religious event for them. They, the uh, the yeah. capital is, what, is their church. Uh, some people look at Wall Street as their church and their God. So you really have to get down to people's belief system. And the people that came up there, they were really religiously tied to coming there to saying that God told them to overturn that election and what Trump is doing now across the land is he's doing that same whistle and that's the reason he's at a fervorish pitch and we don't see it because we live in some blue areas but let me tell you what's out there in the field it's really bad it's it's a cult of race it's a cult of nationalism it's a cult of violence that uses religious language to mask its intent and and the the need for religious thinkers to challenge that directly in their face and say, show me where Jesus said that. Show me where that's in the Bible. Show me, you know, that that's the, yeah. I, it, it, you know, like, the thing you say about Trump is so, so funny and so good. He has no clue, but he knows if he says it's in the Bible, then there's a whole bunch of people. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that's why we have to thank God for the life, the living of Reverend Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. um, loved the man in so many ways that he understood his life was taken. He was assassinated at 39 years of old. And I look at him as having really like a spiritual technology. He took the church beyond these stained glass windows and he understood the law and the religion and corrected what was broken in it. The religion said we were less than human religion. We were less than religion. You have to marry the law with religion in order to have this uh, adultery of, it, of indecency to enslave someone. You have to feel good about yourself when you do this. You don't want to feel bad. And to the degree that we have the conversation, then he wanted to use the level of consciousness to hurt people, that he was willing to be a self-sacrificial person mm -hmm. to say, "Let I will suffer into greatness. And so he was very strategic, and he was a big thinker, but he was a man of God. So every time I go past that mall and thank God, for him, I think about him all the time. He's not the first black to be on the mall that's significant to me. He's the first non-elected official, non-military, non-general. Everyone of faith ought to be proud mm -hmm. of that. He just came through the African-American culture. But we don't honor people that come through religious experiences. And we need to erect more monuments and more statues <laughs> uh, for people that have done this great work. Yes, sir. The way we frame this issue is critically important. This is a public health issue. Amen. The leading cause of death in children in the United States of America is not cancer, it's not car accidents, it's gun violence, all right? 50 years ago, if we were sitting in this room, this room would have been filled with cigarette smoke. 1974. How do I know that? I was a smoker then. I smoked a pack to a pack and a half to two packs of cigarettes a day. You couldn't go anywhere in this country where there wasn't cig cigarette smoke 
in, in everywhere. We, we turned it around because we said this is a public health emergency. People are getting sick, they're getting lung cancer, C, CP, CPO, CP, oh, oh yeah. Um, and they're dying. The same thing is happening with guns in this country. This is pure insanity, but it's a major public health crisis. Let's frame it that way. I love that, and it is public health. And also, mental health is public health. Uh, we've got someone that can't stop lying. The man won't tell the truth. And to the degree that that becomes normalized, I think children do what's natural until they learn what's normal. Children do what's natural until they learn, until they learn what's normal. We have normalized this level of violence. And it starts with violent words. Then it become violent acts, and then it becomes violent actions. But it starts with the words. We are tolerating too much violence. You know, we saw, um, and it's for it's going to be for push too. And your brother's not going to like this. Um, we saw pastors come together um, around Gaza. Uh, New York Times ad. Uh, Atlanta Constitution ad. Um, it would be, I think, important for FOR and uh, PUSH and other allied organizations to begin to mobilize pastors and religious leaders of every faith here in America uh, on the issue of gun violence. You know, we did a, uh, we've done other, we did the Mother's Day thing, whatever, but it's the religious leadership are going to change this around. And so, Let's talk about putting together a coalition of religious leadership to stop the killing. One hundred percent supportive of that, and uh, I would just do that idea out in public, but want to discuss that with you privately. Let's exalt our heroes. I don't like spending time cursing the dark. I want to light my light. And, and go forward. So when I mention the name Heather Heyer, when I mention the name Officer Sicknick, when I mention the name Mahatma Gandhi, and when I mention the name Reverend Martin Luther King, let's show those persons that the right wants to bury. That young lady that went to Charlottesville, Heather Heyer is her name. She was in the right place at the right time, like, and she stood up for the right thing. We can't let her name die. It wasn't in vain. I mean, we have a martyr and Officer Sicknick, a man who did the right thing at the right time, they're not going to mention him at the conventions. We have to do that. When January 20th comes around and it's Inauguration Day, we have to mention the name Reverend Martin Luther King and continue to extol the virtues of lives that we respect and we want to emulate in society. Thank you so much.